you know the, the whole saga about for want of a nail, the shoe was lost for want of a shoe, the horse was lost for want of a horse, the battle. <clears throat> well, that is really what, what this was about. Um, and so, um, this is a saga that happened in Missouri when Harriet Woods, as perhaps maybe some of you remember, a wonderful candidate named Harriet Woods, uh, was running and lost by just a few thousand votes. And this is what happens which when we don't think our votes matter, right? <clears throat> if Harriet Woods hadn't been defeated by less than 2% of the votes in Missouri, Danforth, who was the incumbent senator, wouldn't have been a U.S. senator. If Danforth hadn't been senator, Clarence Thomas wouldn't have gone with him to Washington as a staff member. If Thomas hadn't been visible in Washington as a rare African American who opposed his community's majority views, he wouldn't have been appointed by the first President Bush to head and to disempower the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and then to sit on the DC Court of Appeals. If Thomas hadn't been given such credentials on purpose, he couldn't have been nominated by the same President Bush to succeed the great civil rights advocate, Justice Thurgood Marshall, on the Supreme Court. If Thomas hadn't been on the Supreme Court, he couldn't have supplied the one vote margin that halted the Florida court-ordered recount. <laughs> you see where this is going, right? <laughs> if there had been a recount, Al Gore, not George W. Bush, would have been president, as was concluded definitively by a post-election examination of all uncounted ballots commissioned by 12 major newspapers. If George W. Bush had not been president, the US would have been way less likely to lose the world's sympathy after 9-11 by launching the longest war in US history with more bombs dropped on Afghanistan than in all of World War II plus billions in tax dollars given to 20,000 private contractors and thousands killed and wounded on both sides. If Al Gore, not George W. Bush, had been president, global warming would have been taken seriously. Also, the US would not have falsified evidence to justify invading oil-rich Iraq, thus starting an eight-year war, and together with Afghanistan, convincing some in Islamic countries that the US is waging a war against Islam. And we see we are reaping the whirlwind here. Without George W. Bush, there would not be the biggest transfer of wealth into private hands in the history of the nation. A pay ratio in which the average CEO earns 475 times more than the average worker. Just for compa comparison, in Canada, it's 20 times. <clears throat> and there wouldn't have been an executive order giving an estimated 40 billion in tax dollars to Catholic, evangelical, and other religious groups with no congressional approval, just on presidential order, often with the appearance of turning religion, churches, into a vote delivery system. Without Clarence Thomas to supply the one vote majority, the Supreme Court might not have ruled that corporations are people <laughs> with a right to unlimited political spending in order to continue all of the above. Well, you get the idea, right? The list goes on. And I, I submit to you that this election that we are in, <laughs> we, the, the, the nail in the shoe and the, you know, may be even more crucial, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, just to say that everything is both personal and political at the same time, I thought I'd end by reading you from the short uh, dedication of this road book. This book is dedicated to Dr. Char John Sharp of London, who in 1957, a decade before physicians in England could legally perform an abortion for any reason other than the health of the woman, took the considerable risk of referring for an abortion a 22-year-old American on her way to India. Knowing only that she had broken an engagement at home to seek an unknown fate, he said, you must promise me two things. First, you will not tell anyone my name. 
Second, you will do what you want to do with your life. <clears throat> Dear Dr. Sharp, I believe you, who knew the law was unjust, would not mind if so long after your death I say this. I've done the best I could with my life. This book is for you. So I have so many questions. Um, and I think, let's start with the, the book. What was it like writing this book? Slow. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> because, you know, movements, maybe you're finding this too. Mm -hmm. Social justice movements give you life and interest in everything you want to write about and take away the time to write. Right? So I would work on this book for a month each summer and then abandon it for the other 11 months. So, you know, it took a very, very, very long time. Did you find that you understood your life in different ways in this process of writing this book? Yes, I, I did really, because I began to realize that I too was a uh, victim, you might say, of either or thinking. Mm. You know, it's like the world is divided into two kinds of people, people who divide everything into two and those who don't. Right. <laughs> and so I had been thinking also that there was an on-the-road life and there was a settling down life and that I had to choose between the two. Of course, I had grown up in a on-the-road life because my father was kind of a gypsy who couldn't stay in Michigan when it got cold, so he would put us in a house trailer and we would live in... Uh, trailer parks, buying and selling antiques and working our way to Florida or California and I wasn't going to school, and, you know, so uh, it, it, that, was, that was familiar to me, but I kept thinking, I'm definitely settling down. Everyone settles down, right? That's right. And it, it took me a long time to realize that actually we both need both. Mm -hmm. I think that's what I discovered here. You know, that we have been... Uh, historically mainly nomads, following the seasons, following animals, uh, but in a group, not oh, to totally by ourselves, with yurts and, you know, campfires and so, right? So I, I, think, I think I discovered the world is not about either or, it's about and. Yeah. Did you have to travel to be able to write the book? Was yes. Anywhere you had to revisit? Where did you have to go, to go back to? Well, um, I mean, I started out life as a writer. Well, actually, I started out trying to be a dancer because I thought I could dance my way out of Toledo, Ohio, where I was living. <laughs> <laughs> Not overwhelmingly practical. <laughs> uh, and, and I became a writer. And in both of those professions, you don't have to talk. Mm. So I definitely did not want to talk. And I was in my mid-30s before I ever spoke in public. Wow. But then, because the, <clears throat> there was so much excitement of social justice, I mean, there'd been the anti-Vietnam War movement and also the civil, and the women's, and especially with the women's movement, I could not get any editors of mine, I was a freelance writer, to be very interested. Or they would say, you know, well, we um, published an article uh, last week about women, and that's enough for, I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> and, and it was so exciting what, what was going on that, uh, and I was, because I had been a writer at New York Magazine, I was getting a few little invitations to speak. So I asked a friend of mine who was fearless <laughs> if she would speak with me, right? Uh, and in that way, I discovered a whole other way of communicating. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wouldn't have discovered it otherwise. Mm -hmm. you know, I would have just been st stuck on the page, which is great, but we only empathize with each other when we're actually physically together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, can you, um, one of the things I was struck by, and I think you talk about it throughout your book, at least I was hearing it, but how traveling influenced and shaped your feminism as someone who was able to... Well, I'll, I'll stop there before I reveal my bias. Or. Well, I mean, <clears throat> it, it influenced it from the beginning because 
uh, my fearless friend was an African American childcare expert. Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, she's married, she has kids, you know, that, that I don't, you know, will be able to. We, I don't know that we focused on the fact that we were one white woman, one black woman traveling together all that much. It was more about, mm -hmm. but of course it turned out to be very important because we got audiences that neither one of us by ourselves right. would have gotten. Right. So, so in, in that sense, you know, and because we were traveling, uh, it, it was really profoundly different. And I just grew to have, also because I was afraid to speak we always left more time for the discussion mm -hmm. than for the speaking. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, so I learned how smart audi audiences are and how funny and amazing and, you know, that you can pretend you're sitting in a circle around a campfire wherever you are. I just came to have faith in it. Mm -hmm. And what do you do about, uh, so I think a lot about the work I do is, is, is within the Black Lives Matter movement, which I understand is like a deeply feminist project and movement. Uh, but it is, it is very American-centered in a lot of problematic ways. And ultimately, it has to be a movement for a whole diaspora. And so when I think about sort of work that is, is more centered on a, a feminist movement, right, what that means in the context of a, a global struggle, and that I guess what I'm asking is, for, is like, what do you imagine a feminist movement fighting for? What is it that women's liberation looks like in a way that isn't prescribing what freedom looks like for folks of other mm -hmm. cultures. So as you've been traveling... But um, I think, I mean, you know, movements... I mean, I learned about talking circles in India, mm -hmm. all right? Movements are one big talking circle. Mm -hmm. I think they're pretty universal. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's a place where you can say what happens to you and you think you're by yourself, but you discover, hey, you know, there are 1,200 people here it happened to too, so... If it happened to unique people, it must be political and we can do something about it. I, I, I don't think it's so different. Did yeah. it ever challenge your sense of, of what feminism means when you were traveling? Well, you know, I lived in India for two years when I first got out of college and, mm -hmm. and that was where I first witnessed uh, talking circles and also you know, the women's movement had been very much part, which I didn't realize until I got there, actually, uh, because together with a friend who, who is from India, a, a dear friend, we decided we would write about Gandhian tactics mm -hmm. because they were well suited to women's movements around the world because they were nonviolent and so on. So the two of us were going around finding his letters, which is mainly how he could be, you know, and then we... Um, interviewed uh, a woman named Kamala Devi Chattopadhyaya who had at, worked with Gandhi and, you know, for many years and so on. And we explained our project to her. She was sitting on the veranda sipping tea and she listened to us and she said, well, my dear, we taught him everything he knew. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> and it turned out, you know, that there had been this huge and was a huge women's movement and the, the whole idea of nonviolence and also he his it, did it help the poorest woman was always his measure uh, you know so it, it wasn't two different things but i have to say that women were not getting the same credit right right <laughs> yeah i get a lot of questions around like uh, what does black queer feminism mean? Because we talk about that a lot. It's sort of the Black Lives Matter movement is a black queer feminist movement. And I always explain, you know, it's that gap between who is affected versus who we show up for and who does the work and who gets the credit, right? Mm -hmm. And those things are not the same. Uh, and they are, they are, we were talking earlier about how you see so much positive progress or change that is happening now in the ways that this movement is taking shape and, and how it functions. Uh, I, I was with a project called We Charge Genocide. That was really my springboard into organizing after a friend of my friend's was murdered by the police. And we went to the UN and we named ourselves after a petition that was filed in 1955 called We Charge Genocide. And then I, we were, we, after we got Damo's name into papers around the world, we pushed for reparations to be passed here in Chicago for Burge survivors. And we were watching this documentary and you see from the 80s all of these people out protesting with, with signs that look the exact same as ours saying we charge genocide in the 80s. And I was just like, how? How are we doing this? Why is this still 
Does it feel that deep? sense it's of a loop? Deep. It's deep. It's very deep. Yeah. Yeah. No. What what progress do you see though? What change have you? Because you have a beautiful line um, uh, in there about altogether I've seen enough change to trust that more will come, mm -hmm. and I that mattered a lot to me. Yeah, it, it is one of the good things about being old, which I <laughs> which is that you remember when it was worse. Hello, you know. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because all my life, all my life, you know, friends, people, and you know, have said some version of, if you don't know, if if you feel you can go to a cop and be sure you're going to be helped, you don't know what it's like to be black in America, and they've been saying it so long. African American in America, mm -hmm. Negro in America. I mean, you know, all my life I've, I've heard this. And now we're forced to realize it isn't, didn't just happen yesterday. So just the consciousness of it mm -hmm. and, the, and cell phones and recording it and understand, you know, that is huge. I mean, I, I know we have a long way to go, but it is pro consciousness. Is, is a huge amount of progress. And I also think because of uh, social justice movements altogether, we are realizing the connections. Mm -hmm. For instance, it turns out that police families have, and you know, we're by no means talking about all police, you understand, but police families have four times the rate of domestic violence as families in the general population. All right, sexist crimes, domestic violence, and racist crimes, to me, I call them supremacy crimes mm -hmm. because you're not getting money out of it, you're not going to, you know, it's just about control, being in control and being superior. So d domestic violence predicts racist violence. Mm -hmm. And we could diminish racist violence if we understood that connection. We haven't yet, but we could. Mm -hmm. Absolutely agree. And I think it's important to note, right, that um, we're in the prison population that is growing the fastest is women of color, particularly, right? And that is, has a lot to do with the ways that we've misunderstood domestic violence. Uh, and, and, it's, and now you have laws that mandate an arrest when someone calls for domestic dispute. And oftentimes it's a woman who's defending herself that's being arrested, right? And just the ways that these very sexist logics are being used against a feminist movement, absolutely. Right. Um, Oh, what was it? There was a thing you had said, though, that I wanted to ask you about. Oh, you, you say another thing in the book about, uh, it's near the beginning where you're talking about how, I don't know if you, you don't use the word frustrating, but that something to the effect of frustrating when it feels like people aren't willing to tell the truth or have a, a truthful conversation, and that limits your ability to create changes because people aren't even willing to... to Yes, you, they're hiding. In front yeah. Of you. yeah it's, right. so, uh, do you think that's different now? I, I'm hearing a sense of things feel... Like a, the consciousness I, maybe is more know, I think so, you know, just because a lot of experiences are out there. You know, if you think, well, okay, we're talking about domestic violence. That, that term didn't exist when I was growing up. Right. It was just called life, you know. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. and the cops, if they were called in a situation of domestic violence in Toledo, where I was growing up, in the east side of Toledo, they felt that they were successful if they got the criminal and the victim back together. Uh, so you know we've we've come a long distance from, from that, yeah. and we you know we obviously have a long way to go, but um, I don't know. I think we've also realized that domestic violence is kind of the paradigm of all violence, in a way, you know, because well, of all uh, superiority crime kind mm -hmm. of violence. Yeah, absolutely. So then, how do you understand the phenomenon of Trump? going through this election. Well, the truth is revealing itself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. That's, That's what Gandhi it. used to say all the time. Yeah. Um, well, he came, obviously, he came up without even the benefit of the Republican Party, which, you know, is in the control of extremists and not the people I always used to know in my life as actual centrist Republicans. Uh, but he came up through the media and he clearly is a protest candidate, you know, mm -hmm. that, he's, that, that he's not part of Washington. That, and it, but it's a deep also protest, I think, against the fact that in about 
very short order, we're no longer going to be a majority white or European American country. And there are a lot of folks who feel displaced in their natural place in the hierarchy. I mean, you know, <laughs> white men, I, it's, everybody who's in this audience is an exception, okay, I'm sure, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> You're nice and <laughs> White men who are Trump voters will look at me and say, a black woman took my job. Okay, what's wrong with that sentence? Why is it his job? You know, it's, it's such a clear statement of privilege, but nonetheless, he was, so that has created a, a fertile ground for Trump. Mm -hmm. But I would just like to say that since the biggest reason people give for voting for him is that he is a successful businessman, and therefore he can run the country. I hope by now we know he is not, as a New Yorker, I want to say, he is not a successful businessman. He is a con man. If he had just invested the money he inherited as a rich kid, he would be way richer than now. He has gone bankrupt and he has, you know, thousands of lawsuits and done in his employees and, you know. So, to the degree that he is, it doesn't matter who he is, he is not from Washington and he's a protest candidate. I think some people are just not looking at the content, don't you? I mean, that's sort of what I hear. But I think more and more people are being forced to look at the content. Yes. Yeah. So are you working actively on the election right now? What kinds of work are you engaged in? Yeah, no, when I'm uh, there because I'm speaking on a campus or uh, for a book or so, you know, I try to also do whatever it is that the good local campaigns, including Hillary Clinton's campaign, ask me to do whatever they tell me that is useful. Okay, got you, yeah. Mm. And then I remember reading, I think it was in an article, that you're also doing something um, with the former Bayview Correctional Facility. Can mm -hmm. you talk about that, what you're doing? Yes, this is great. I mean, uh, one other big consciousness thing, obviously, uh, I mean, Angela Davis has been t talking about the prison industrial complex for 40 years, mm -hmm. right? Okay, but we're finally beginning to get that it is absurd that we have such a huge proportion of our population in prison uh, and uh, doubly absurd that prisons are a source of profit that, that, you know, they're privatized. I mean, fortunately, the federal government just stopped doing that, but there are 30 states in which they are still... So Wackenhut, you know, is making money by keeping people longer it's totally crazy, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> uh, and uh, one small symbol of change, I hope, is that the Bayview Women's Prison in Manhattan, which is now empty because during Hurricane Sandy it was flooded and so on, and so they did indeed close the prison. We have, uh, we've spent 40 years trying to have a women's center and never, because <laughs> New York real estate is mm -hmm. tough, okay. But anyway, we, lobbied for two years and got a 99-year lease on, on this building. And so we are changing it from a women's prison into a women's center. And all of the women who are still around and want to be, who are, were incarcerated there are part of this. And they are leading tours and saying what happened in the cells and so on. And uh, we will transform eventually the inside to turn it into a place so there are reasonable rents and you know a place where people can have offices and where when people come from other countries they don't have to spend a month trying to find different groups you know they can the, San Francisco has a beautiful women's building which perhaps you've seen right and so we 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 think it's big time symbolism that we are changing that building well yeah that's one of the most beautiful campaigns that I have heard of, um, as someone who focuses on prisons and police, yeah. Uh, and it makes me want to ask this question that I'm saving for the end, so I'm going to do an awkward transition to a question around uh, how you understand, or what you understand solidarity to mean. I'll leave it at that. Well, you know, it's not, <clears throat> I don't think it is a end in itself, mm -hmm. <laughs> because you don't want to suppress discussion or differences because 
<clears throat> you know, so much creative comes out of that. But I do think that we want to say, okay, I see what you're doing, and it's 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 speaking <laughs> against an injustice, and maybe it's not the same injustice I've experienced, but I'm with you, and you're with me. You know, it's a way of crossing over those boundaries. And of course, it comes from the union movement, basically. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it's, it's really very important. And I think there are other little parts of it, if this, see if this makes sense. I think one way of understanding democracy is that the ends don't justify the means, the means are the ends. So if we just do little things like support each other in solidarity, if we just remember that if we are in a group in which we have more power, usually, we have to remember to listen as much as we talk. And if we have less power, we have to remember to talk as much as we listen, which can be very difficult because we're used to hiding, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think, I think actually what Marx and Engels got most wrong was that the ends justify the means because mm -hmm. the, the means reflect I mean, the ends reflect, but, and that's what's great about the three organizing rules there you go. <laughs> of, of, of Black Lives Matter, uh, which are, do you want to say that? No, go ahead. Uh, well, uh, high, e high, wait a minute, high impact, low ego mm -hmm. is the first one, right? No, know. no, no, there's, love as a motive is the first one. Okay. Yeah. I don't even then, know. Then, then uh, low. <laughs> Low ego, high impact. And the third one is move at the speed of trust. I love that. Mm -hmm. Okay. There was this, um, I thought you were referring, we were saying something like, oh, that's that part of that book where you say, there is power in proximity, get close to the problem you feel drawn to, change the narrative, stay hopeful, be willing to do uncomfortable things. So I thought that's what we were referring to, but yeah, which I love as sort of four organizing principles. Um, Another, so, okay, so we talked about solidarity. Um, what was another question for you around that? Well, yeah, what advice do you have to organizers right now? Oh, I remember. Listen, I am so happy. Do you know that this woman teaches organizing? Is that not great? I mean. Sure. Yeah, a very lucky job. Yeah, very lucky. <laughs> you know, I don't, because uh, I never know how to describe what I do. I mean, I'm a writer. But I always have finally just said I'm an organizer because I, and it's like being a kind of entrepreneur of social change in a way. Mm -hmm. And it is such fun, you know, because you get to put things together in a different way and say, well, maybe if this person knew that person. And so, and Wilma Mankiller, the chief of the Cherokee Nation, who's no longer with us, I'm sorry to say, uh, we decided if we had one more organ, one more something in us, it was a school for organizers. So, so I'm drafting her to come teach yes. at this yeah. school. That, <laughs> yeah, it's desperately needed, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then what, if you could uh, give a list to men, just like, these are the five things, just if you only do five things, do these five, <laughs> what would it be? Well, one would be, suppose you are exactly the same person with the same dreams and humor and everything, and you were born female. How would you? Because there's nothing that beats empathy, right? Um, and uh, one would be that the feminist movement is meant to liberate mm -hmm. men too, because gender is a prison. I mean, men's prison of masculinity may have wall-to-wall -wall carpets and people to serve you coffee, but... <laughs> <laughs> It's still a prison because we all have all human qualities and it's still saying, you know, you have to behave in a certain way, you know, you can't express emotion or you have to, I don't know, what, what, whatever it is. Yes. Um, that's the second one. And, and I would say that realizing that will lengthen your life. You know, we once tried to deduct from all the reasons why men die, you know, statistically speaking, uh, all the ones that could be attributed to the masculine role. Uh, violence, guns, 
hypertension related diseases, speeding, I don't know. And it turned out that men would live five years longer. So I would say, that's not a bad offer, you know. <laughs> well, the women's movement, have to, you know. So, so uh, I would say, yeah, be, you know, become a feminist because you're going to live longer as well as, <laughs> as, as, well as have a more interesting life. Yeah. How, how many have I, am I up to? I, I count two. <laughs> three? three? Three. Okay, three. Um, Get two more. Well, I th also think that, I'm, I, I don't mean to overgeneralize, but I think women tend to become whole people by living a life outside the home, mm -hmm. and men come to be whole people by living a life inside the home and raising children, too. You know, that we... It's because those the things, the qualities that are wrongly called feminine are just usually what you need to raise kids. Patience, empathy, mm -hmm. attention to, to, you know. Uh, and so men become whole people by either raising children or being raised to raise children. I mean, whether we have children or not, we're kind of raised to raise yeah, children, right? Mother, yeah. um, what, do I have one more? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can go as, I, I'm a, I love lists. I love giving people lists of things oh, well, to do. Give it, so. No, well, do your list. Oh, I'm, I'm much ruder. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. um, one thing I always like to do, it's hard here because it's so packed, but just look down the aisles and notice how many men are sitting like this versus right. like this and how many women are sitting like this. So just being aware of space that you take up. Um, I organize a lot with physical, like a literal space. You see it a lot on the trains here. Things like uh, whenever you're in a room, there's a line that I really liked in the book as well. It, ref uh, it, it was a story a woman was sharing and she spoke out at this meeting and then afterwards she said, that's the first time I've ever talked in public. And I'm someone who's always been pretty outspoken and so that was hard for me to imagine, but also I can definitely understand. Uh, and so being aware of always letting three people talk before you and three people talk after you before you respond, things like that. Um, those are just some rules that I personally <coughs> like to share. Or guide no, us. I agree. You make me remember that in the beginning, uh, Flo Kennedy, do you remember, does anybody remember Flo Kennedy? We, we <laughs> who was also one of my speaking partners, we used to just ask people, a whole audience to stand up and just stay there and then look at how they were standing. And the women were usually standing like this mm -hmm. and the men were usually standing like this. And so we would just say, reverse that now. You know, so the men are standing the women. And it's amazing how much just a little thing like that changes yeah. how you feel. Mm -hmm. And that's what you were doing, yeah. yeah. Yep, yeah. at restaurants I'll see um, the, the, the outer part, if, at like a booth, tabling, the men will always sit on the outside as if they're protecting the women. It's, it's, I, once it was pointed out to me, it is, I'll go to a restaurant tonight, just like, yeah, go do that and look. Just peep in the window, see what's going on, and you'll see. It's a line. It's amazing, these weird rules that are all around us. And it makes me think, as we were describing sort of the, the gendering of labor, I think a lot of organizing is very, it's very feminine labor. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's a lot of, of care, it's people. a lot of nurturing, it's a lot of people, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, and there are, I mean, a big moment for me when I started organizing more was when I started to learn about these women, right? It made me feel more capable and confident. And uh, I, I wonder in your experience, like what is the role that sexiness has played in, in quashing, in, in, in limiting our capacity? Because women are really dope, I believe in our magic. Uh, and I think that there have always been women doing incredible things. And yet we, lo we lose so much by not knowing their names, not knowing their stories, which is why I appreciate you for doing this. And not knowing that that is the work. It's not just giving these bold speeches, right? Mm -hmm. Um, well, the toughest thing is the internalized oppression, as they say, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I, I should have written a book called It's Probably Only Me, but, because I... <laughs> <laughs> Next one, yeah. Because <laughs> we, you know, we disqualify ourselves, uh, and we need each other's help and men's help in identifying that mm -hmm. and just changing our, our consciousness of it. Uh, and, you know, little things can make, just as I was saying, you know, look, balancing talking and listening, you know, can make a huge difference. And when you're asked what movie you want to go to, not saying, I don't know, what movie do you want to go to, right? But yes. <laughs> actually making a suggestion, hello. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's amazing what a difference the small things, small things make. 
and you know the body things you know restrictions and well you know I actually think sports for women are undervalued mm. because sports have done more to show us that women's bodies are instruments not ornaments than almost anything else I can think of and that is so important you know that to stop assessing how you, you look and assess what you can do instead mm -hmm. we're getting towards the end and so I have this question that I've been saving I get it asked it at everything I do and I talk a lot at things and I yeah it's a hard question for me uh, and the question is what do you think freedom is well Classically, just another name for nothing left to lose. But <laughs> <laughs> I might take no, that. No, but wait. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I, okay, I have a better answer. I have a better answer. <laughs> Here's why. Um, a few years ago, I realized that laughter is the only free emotion. You can compel fear, obviously. You can also compel love because if you are isolated and dependent for long enough, you become enmeshed to survive, you may think you're in love. But laughter comes when you learn something, you recognize something, two things come together and suddenly make a third, you know? It's free, it's free. And in Native American culture, there is often a person, male, just both male and female, who is, the, not a jester, because jesters make kings laugh. It's not about that. The, um, it's not about pleasing somebody. It's laughter. It's the sheer spirit of laughter, because they say that laughter breaks through into the unknown, and if you can't laugh, you can't pray. So I would say <laughs> a pretty good guideline is don't hang out any place where they don't let you laugh. <laughs> including religion, including church and temples and so on. No. <laughs> and, you know, it's, um, it's a pretty good measure, no? Laughter's how often we're laughing in our lives. Yeah. You're right. Because it is free. It's a moment of freedom. It's important to me that you name it as it's not always this thing it's very far, right? There ha there's moments that we feel it, and I think they are some kind of a fuel, right? That right. You, you, you leap between those moments, trying to grab the next one. Okay. I'm not sure. I want to check in with our hosts. I think we're at time for questions. Um, questions? questions? Or answers. <laughs> or organizing announcements. Gloria, first off, thank you. Because of the book I got in 1992 upon high school graduation, it changed my life. And in Revolution from Within, you talked a lot about the mistakes you made. I want to know what's the best mistake you ever made. <laughs> the best mistake? Hmm. <laughs> I'm tempted to say not getting married, but I realize that that's a... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying, you know, right, just that in my generation, I was so told that you had to get married and that it would determine your whole life because then your children's needs and your husband's needs would run. And I, I hope this isn't going on anymore, but it, for, for us in my generation, it made marriage sound a lot like death. <laughs> <laughs> so I just kept putting it off. And then fortunately, the women's movement came along and I realized that I was happy. You know, I mean, we all, get to live in, in, in different ways, you know? But, hmm, mistake, huh? You know, I, I guess I would also say never having a job because I've always been a freelancer. That also was not supposed to happen, except my father was kind of totally a gypsy, so it helped me live with insecurity. <laughs> But that also, I thought, was temporary. 
And I've really come to value it because I think every movement needs a few people who can't be fired. <laughs> Gloria, thank you for all that you have done first. For you. And then the second the second thing I wondered was how did you move forward past the defeat of the Equal Rights Amendment? Hmm. Yeah, it was really heartbreaking, wasn't it? I hear it in your voice, really heartbreaking. Because uh, it was so fundamental. I think it helped me to realize why. You know, because there was a sort of a myth out there that Phyllis Schlafly and women killed the Equal Rights Amendment. But from lobbying in state legislatures, including here, <laughs> I, I realized over time that it was really economic that the single greatest reason why the Equal Rights Amendment didn't pass was because the insurance industry didn't want to equalize their actuarial tables, uh, to, to take sex out of the actuarial tables, as they had had to take race out of the actuarial tables. So I, I realized that actually I at least had been naive in the beginning because I thought, oh, this is such a simple thing and it's left over from the first suffragist abolition, but you know, how can we not pass this? Uh, and I, I, I realized I had just been really uh, naive about what it really would mean. Okay, so the Equal Rights Amendment is coming back. You can find ERA coalitions on, on the web. And what we're trying to figure out, and I, I don't know the answer now, we're supposed to have a conference to figure this out, whether maybe this time it should be uh, both sex and race because the 14th Amendment, which was not being applied to sex discrimination, is now sometimes applied. But the 14th Amendment has problems within it, too. So uh, we're trying to figure this out. But anyway, mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's coming back. It's coming back. All right. Hi, Gloria. Um, I'm 18. And I get to vote for the first time in this election. Um, and I'm very... Uh, <laughs> um, obviously, we have like a great choice this year. Um, but I have a question. What do you have to say to Trump supporters who use masculinity as an excuse for his comments? As an excuse for... His comments regarding women. I don't know, it's the same thing as uh, using racism as an excuse or, you know, I mean, it's, it's saying uh, I expect to be superior. But I guess what I would really say is that Trump is so not masculine. <laughs> I mean, it's so clearly <clears throat> if you think about it, masculine is strong or whatever, you know, your definitions are, he is just a mess, you know, look at him. I mean, <laughs> I mean he, he's always rating women because he's so insecure about the way he looks, you know, he's, he's, he's not even a one, you know. <laughs> Every, every once in a while, his, his jacket, you know, opens and you see this gelatinous mass there. <laughs> <laughs> we have one back here. Hi, Gloria. Um, I went to an all-women's college. I went to Smith. And um, I get asked the question a lot, why are all women's colleges still relevant? I think a lot of people feel the feminist movement has progressed far enough that we don't need these spaces where women get together and learn from each other mm -hmm. and become empowered. And sometimes I have 
trouble telling them just how important and just how empowering that experience was. And I was wondering what your response mm -hmm. to that question would well, be. Well, you know, it's, it's not that women's colleges are right for everybody. It's just that it's good to have them there as a choice. Uh, if, like historically black colleges are important to have as a choice. Because if you have grown up without the experience of being central at some time in your life, it's helpful. I mean, if you've gone to a prep school and it's all girl, you know, maybe you want to go to a big university. It, you know, it, it, it's, it's all about balance. But since some groups of folks are still a, a bit on the periphery, because of the way the culture works, then it is helpful to have some amount of time in which you are central. For one thing, it keeps you from blaming the powerful group because you see that among yourselves, uh, you need to develop for all, all the human qualities and not just put the blame on, on somebody else. So I think there's a reason why it's still true that women who are in science, in politics, or in so-called, you know, not usually feminine fields, still disproportionately have graduated from women's colleges. Not Holyoke. <laughs> the feminist community today is often critiqued or criticized really for being very white-centric. This is a white women's thing nowadays. How can we work to include more people from diverse communities, um, LGBT and black and Hispanic, et cetera, communities today? Well, first of all, we can stop rendering invisible the black women who invented feminism. Uh -huh. You know, it is just, it, it drives me <laughs> so off the wall. Um, I mean, Fannie Lou Hamer was the first person to talk about reproductive politics and sterilization, and Shirley Chisholm took the white male sign off the White House door all by herself. <laughs> and uh, Eleanor Holmes, I don't know, I mean, we could just, there, there are, with two friends of mine, African-American women, we are writing a book called Black Women Who Invented Feminism because we are going crazy. We're all of an age when we remember all of these women. So, and also when Ms. Magazine first started, we did the first poll of women's uh, opinions. Something's happening. Yeah, let's, we heard you laughing earlier. Okay. We yeah, we wondered what you were laughing at earlier. But, uh, we did the first Lewis Harris national poll of women's opinions on on issues and the women's movement, issues of equality and the women's movement. And the results were that uh, more than 60% of, uh, that didn't measure Latina and Asian women, it was just African American women and European American women, that more than 60% of black women supported the issues in the women's movement and only 30% of white women. It is so wrong, so wrong. Now, I realize that the whole country is racist and so there are a lot of racist things that have happened, you know, and we have to be constantly aware of, it's probably also true that white women have an easier time getting their books published, right? So, <laughs> right. so they're, been, right. So, so it's, it's not that there's, you know, no racism, there is, and we need to be constantly aware. But to say that the women's movement is a white middle-class movement is to render black women invisible who were there always. Hi, my name is Brenda, and I was wondering if you have any comments or insights into the work of Kirsten Gillibrand into the issues of rape in the military and any comments or insight in what you think is going on in rape in America in general. Yes, I'm very proud of, of my senator, Kirsten Gillibrand from New York State. I think, you know, she's the third generation of political women in her family. She is so, you know she's incredibly smart because you can understand every word she says. <laughs> <laughs> and she really, really has, has uh, been a voice against sexual assault in the military and against having only the traditional chain of command as a way to remedy sexual assault and also sexual assault on campus. Um, 
No, I'm very proud of her. I think she could be a presidential candidate sometime. Right. I've got one way in the back here. Give me a second. Um, we've all been frustrated and disappointed about the Equal Rights Amendment, but there is another, which is CEDAW. Mm -hmm. That's C-E-D-A-W. <laughs> yeah, this, it, 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 you know, we, we criticize other countries, but we haven't, uh, you know, this is a, a, a international United Nations treaty that relating, you know, to equality that we have not passed. And there's, uh, you know, a, a, whole, a whole raft of reasons why, because people are worried that it would interfere with domestic law in some way, but it's really that it's not a priority, and it's a shame. Good evening, Gloria. It's an honor to be here, and I'm thrilled to have the last question. I am the mother of a 17-year-old daughter, and as you have mentioned, we have made so much progress as, a, as women and as feminists in this audience here. How do I explain to my 17-year-old why feminism or how feminism is relevant for her life? Well, you know, I don't think... I would say that if you, if you support her and support her dreams and of course, she's looking at you, you know, so we need to be aware of that, you know. I think to myself, you know, if when, every time a woman goes past a mirror and criticizes her body, a girl is watching, you know, so, you know, we need to be aware of the role we are playing. Uh, but life will radicalize her, trust me. <laughs> and and in the, in the meantime, I think it's just making sure that she uh, realizes that she should be as safe in the street as boys who are 17. You know, that she shouldn't have to uh, worry about her appearance more or spend more. You know, it, it's, if we think everything's okay, it's just that we have low standards. So, <laughs> um, but also I would just say, support her, you know, I mean, we each have this unique person inside of us that's some unique combination of heredity and environment for millennia and millennia that is on ours alone, and then we're also shared humanity, you know, we're both things at the same time. So inside your daughter is a whole, when every parent I know has said to me, that they were meeting their child, you know, that there's this unexpected person there, right? So, <laughs> um, if, she, uh, if she's encouraged to and feels okay about doing what she loves, what she forgets what time it is when she's doing it because she loves it so much, you know, then when she comes up against barriers that prevent her from doing that, she'll get mad as hell. <laughs> Uh, which is healthy and great. And I, I have to say, I know there's a kind of feeling that millennials, oh, they have to say that when people talk about millennials, they behave as if they're all white. Have you noticed that? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, because otherwise they wouldn't assess them in the same way. Um, but the young women to me are so wildly ahead of where anything <laughs> where we were. So, you know, the, the, the only way, a couple of months ago, I tried to figure out how to answer how I feel about this, and here was the only thing I could come up with. Um, so I just had to wait for some of my friends to be born. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.